Um, we're joined today by Terry Cole, the president, founder, CEO of Coal Mine Records and Plaid Room Records located in Loveland, Cincinnati, Ohio. Thanks for coming on today, Terry. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Coal Mine is uh, certainly, you've usurped uh, Daptone, I would say, as the, uh, the preeminent R&B soul label these days. Damn, um, that's, uh, that's some high praise. That's, that's very kind. Well, I I, love, we, we love those folks. I think uh, their business model, though, uh, based on aging soul singers, uh, you know, uh, had, had a certain shelf life. And uh, with the passing of Sharon Jones, Charles Brown, yeah. they seem to have receded a little bit more. And, and just the sheer volume of stuff that you guys churn out is, uh, is pretty staggering. Very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. And, you know, I have no doubt that uh, Daptone and Penrose and Dunham will be, uh, you know, they're, they're going to keep making great records and, you know, they're going to find the next whoever it will be. You know, that's, that's what they do just steady as she goes so certainly tell us if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing with our listeners and uh, viewers how you got started a lot of times uh the label the label uh like say in the stacks or motown case it came out of a record store the record store was where it began and then to a label you seem to have done it done it the in the opposite direction yeah i, I guess there's like a couple of distinct phases uh in the label's life you know so um I started selling records when I was like 13 on eBay. Um, so like uh, to come back to what we were talking about earlier about not having enough money to go to private school. Well, I certainly didn't have no, enough money to afford college tuition. Um, so uh, our dad was a record collector. So we had, but he collected 45s and he didn't really have any interest in uh, like 78s or really LPs, but he knew what they were worth. And so in like 98, um, as a way to start saving money for college, he started teaching us how to buy and flip records, basically. And, and it was you and your brother? Uh, yeah, at, at that time. So my younger brother was, he started with me because I was 13. And my younger brother was like 10 at the time. And then our youngest brother was like seven. So he started with me and then we just sort of like handed it off over time, sort of. So um, yeah, we started selling 78s on eBay in like 98. And that was back when eBay was like the Wild West. And and it was kind of saturated with a lot of people selling LPs and 45s. And there wasn't a lot of people selling 78s. And again, my dad had no emotional or like collector attachment to them. So we just like started just killing that market. And so I did that until um, all the way through graduate school. I sold records on eBay. And so while doing that, I was getting, you know, getting degrees, going to be a teacher, but also I took just as many classes in biology, which was my degree as I did music history. And so the whole time I was like, really had this idea. And I was so inspired by Daptone, you know, like finding out that they existed was just like this magical thing to me. Uh, and so in truth and soul as well. And so it was like, how do I do that? And so when I got done with grad school and started teaching, I started the label and it was always meant to just be a hobby. You know, I was going to put out 45s that me and my friends produced in my basement. And that was it. You know, it was, that was, and, and so, and that's what it was while I was a teacher. It was like that from like 2007 until probably 2014. Um, and then I became um, frustrated with the administration of my district um and not really anything that i was having to deal with i had an amazing job i taught zoology and botany both electives both upperclassmen amazing kids uh it was just the politics that in the, the direction of the whole sort of public school system was heading in it wasn't any fun so i was like you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna get out of here i'm gonna quit this and i went across the country my last before my last year of teaching and i went to like 100 some record stores just sort of hustling the label, you know, like door to door. I'd just gotten divorced. So I had nothing holding me in Middletown. So I was like, well, I'm going to spend these two months just on the road and seeing the, seeing the country and uh, getting to know record store owners. And it was never because I had the intent of opening a record store. I just wanted to grow the label. And so I just, you know, would go to stores, shoot the breeze, 
you know, talk shit. And then, hey, I got these 45s. And uh, at that point, we only had two LPs and, you know, like 30 45s or something. But it was remarkable how well, like, record stores were doing. And, and this is 2014. So this is, like, really before it's, it's taken the big upturn. Um, and it was just also remarkable how willing these shops were to like support what I was doing by myself, basically with bands they'd never heard of on sevens. And, uh, so it was in, it like kind of like lit a fire. And so I got back to school and taught that fall and I was like, I'm done. Like I, I can see the light I'm done. And so my younger brother, Bob had just finished grad school and he had just gone on like a, a kind of find yourself, solo camping journey in the Canadian wilderness for like two months and the day he got out and he's driving back to Ohio I called him and I was like dude meet me in Indianapolis at Luna Music I was like I got an idea I was like we should open a record store I was like we've sold records for you know a decade like we know how to do this we could do this and uh so that was 20 we opened in 2015 and um and that was when we could finally dedicate a lot of time to actually figuring out how to grow and, and operate a record label so that was and that's been just like I feel like from that day it was like somebody just stepped on the gas and it's just been like hold on here we go <laughs> right on and and it was that how, how you also established relationships with a lot of these bands because say dab tone or truth and soul I mean those acts seem to be based in Brooklyn but if I'm not mistaken, I mean, you, your roster seems to be from all over the country. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was one of the things early on, like even while I was teaching that, um, that allowed us to grow or me at that point really to grow was because yeah, Daptum was doing all their in-house production. Truth and soul was doing all their in-house production and I was producing too. But at the same time, if somebody brings me a finished master, that's awesome that I love, I'm not going to be like, well, no, I, I didn't produce it. Um, and so, you know, those first few records, like the Eekaby Shakedown that Tommy Brennick produced um, and the first Monophonics 45 that we did and Jungle Fire, like those, those two records in particular kind of like broke us into the Cali scene because at that point you had Ubiquity, but Ubiquity really wasn't doing sevens like that back then. And so we were able to kind of get like get artists that maybe we didn't deserve to get, but because we were willing to be like, yo, we'll put a seven out. Like, that's fine. Or, Hey, you got a sweet LP. Let me pick my favorite two best songs. And I don't want any rights. I just want to put this, the, the 45 out. And so the catalog grew at a pretty quick clip, I think. And, and uh, as I learned visiting family in Cincinnati, I mean, certainly I'm a huge James Brown, King Records fan, but there, I, I learned there was a tremendous history of record labels and recording in Cincinnati. Are, are a lot of those means of production still there in Cincinnati? I know King no longer exists, but uh, that you produce your vinyl is, are, are all those different pieces to the puzzle available um, there? Some of them, like, uh, so there was a company called QCA, uh, Queen City, and, and they made like, they, they pressed records in the 60s and 70s. And, and there was a Columbia plant here at one time. And there's obviously, there's a lot of manufacturing and stuff in Cincinnati, but all of our records are pressed in Cleveland now at Gotta Groove. But a lot of our labels, a lot of our like four color labels um, are all printed in Cincinnati. And it's a friend of mine who I know he'll like, he'll like message me when he sees a big run of our stuff coming through and might be stuff I haven't even seen yet. And I'm just like, ah, oh, that's so cool. And uh, a lot of the plating is done in Cincinnati too. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool. You know, a lot, a lot of times, sometimes it won't leave the state. It's pretty neat. You know, the labels will be made here. The plating's done here. The lacquer's cut in Cleveland and then they're pressed in Cleveland and then they come to us. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Terry, would you say the coal mine has a, a signature sound and, and how would you describe the coal mine sound? I, I don't know. Um, I think it's, you know, when I think of Daptone, I think they have a signature sound, you know, like I recognize a Daptone record. I think our sound um, is similar, but maybe just more 
broad you know like a little not quite as narrow so like um but i do think i think maybe one of the most common things is definitely the drums um you know i think no matter who records the drums i mean and that, i think that's kind of the case for for me with records in general you know if the drums aren't good it's really hard for me to come around on the record and that sounds so stupid but like if they don't hit then i'm like well what are we doing here you know why why are we here in this room um so i think that's definitely a, a commonality you know I think I tell a lot of our artists that we always want the label to feel like it is, it, it makes people feel the way that old records make them feel, you know, but we don't want people to mistake them for old records. I never want people to be anybody to be like, Oh, this sounds like it could come out in 1973. When I hear that, I'm like, ah, oh, well, I guess we should have done something better then. Cause I wanted to, I wanted to evoke those feelings but I want it to still be forward facing, you know? Um, and so I guess we're trying to, you know, grab things sonically that stir emotions, you know, and connect people to those old late sixties, early seventies sounds, but don't have to live there. You know, they can still be a 2021 record. Um, but, and hopefully the, hopefully the listener isn't even aware of that. You know, that's the best is when somebody just likes something and they don't know why that means you did your, you did your job well, you know, because maybe you know why they like it because it's got dirty breakbeat drums or something that makes them feel a certain way. But um, yeah, I, I think steeped in like those old authentic sounds, but trying to be forward facing. Who were your uh, musical influences coming up? Um, I think, uh, you know, our dad was super into doo wop. Um, and so he would play, you know, mid 50s doo wop. If you asked him, he would tell you uh if you asked him what kind of records he collected he would almost to jar people he'd be like black doo-wop like explicit like he would like almost to like he's a shock jockey so he wants to like he wants to catch people off guard and be like oh okay uh, okay guy um but yeah so he listened to a lot of like mid-50s doo-wop and r&b um and so i think the natural progression for me was to get into like 60s harmony soul as you kind of move down that timeline and I, I would say Curtis Mayfield is sort of the as much as JB is maybe rhythmically um I say writing arranging just like North Star Curtis is kind of it for me um but uh you know I also love Blue Note Jazz and I also love you know just tons of other r&b and funk and soul and classic rock and indie rock but i think stuff you know things related to the impressions and and the early curtis records to me are kind of like key because they connect to hip-hop you know they connect to soul they connect to to harmonies and, and r&b and and messages of like empowerment and so it's just like it's kind of the crux of everything i love how about uh, business influences? Would you say your old man as well? I guess so. Yeah, for sure. I guess I got to give him something. Um, he was a, you know what? Kind of. So he was like, he taught us how not to, we would go to flea markets. Um, he was cheap. I mean, he's cheap. He's classic. Like, you know, we're all Irish and I'm not saying Irish people are cheap, but he's, he's like frugal to a fault so like we were um i remember we were flea market one time and there were these rockabilly 45s and i had just like he had just started teaching me about like local ohio rockabilly and i saw these 45s and i knew they were like five six seven hundred dollar 45s and the guy had 50 cents a piece on them pretty good deal and so i like bring him up to my dad i was like 15 i'm like dad like look at these like, it's, it's like 50 cents a piece and he's like give them to me and he uh, goes up to the guy and, you know, he had this way of looking at records just in disgust, you know, just like, how dare you try to charge 50 cents for this pile of garbage, you know? So he just looks at it and he goes, how much you want for these? And the guy said, you know, 50 cents a piece, you know? And he goes, well, you take three for a dollar and um he's like sure and i'm like god man what are you doing so it was like 
it was like sport back then. And so I think Bob and I, my brother, I think we're like atoning for his sins by trying to make really fair deals with our artists and, and you know, people bring in these records to the store and I'm like, man, I don't want to pay any money for these, but yeah, sure. Here's 20 bucks that I'm never going to make back, but you know, whatever karma, I'm trying to get some good juju for me. Um, but I don't know, business wise, it, it's always felt like treat people fairly, be transparent. Um, you know, don't over promise, just do your best. We, you know, we work hard, we try to work hard and work really smart. I think that's something we pride our, there's like a Midwest pride to that, you know, like, like working hard, working smart. And um, I think that's kind of the guiding philosophy, you know, just steady as she goes and not, not spend too much time looking at other labels that are doing great things and be like, how do we do that? Just more know that we're growing and know that we're making the right moves and stay that course. Talk about the music community in uh, Cincinnati and Loveland, Ohio. The, the music communities, I think it leans, there's a pretty thriving like metal scene. There's a pretty strong like folk Americana scene. Um, indie, like the shoegaze stuff, there's a lot of that. There's not the funk stuff and soul stuff sort of falls into that category of we're a funk band. And you're like, all right. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like, and it's really hard. You know, it's, I, I understand that it's, I get that the nuances that I'm looking for are like subtle and I don't ever expect anybody to be like, yo, here's my thing I just finished and me to be like all on board for it. But um, I think there's, you know, we're working with, a, and there is a couple, there's a couple of label friends of mine, you know, Melvin who runs uh, soul step records and Jason who runs another label chiefdom records. I think we're going to start working doing a couple of 45s with Jason. Cause he's like, he's doing, he's coming from a very much a hip hop, sort of world and because there, there's also a deep like hip-hop community so it's a pretty diverse it's a pretty diverse music community but i mean there are a lot as far as record stores it's very rich in record stores i can definitely speak to that like if you're a person that lives in cincinnati and loves record stores you've got your pick you know everybody's got different strengths and they're everywhere you know i think i last count like 15 to 20 in Cincinnati and you know all sort of specializing in different things and it's cool not every city has that you know and you have two shops that have direct accounts with all the major labels so that the prices in a, as in a general are pretty low which is unique sometimes you don't even have any one city or one store in a city that has direct accounts with the majors so that the general market will stay low because and Cincinnati's cheaper than Indy, cheaper than Columbus, cheaper than Louisville. I'm not talking any smack about any of my my friends that run record stores, but I mean Cincinnati's just kind of a generally very competitive market. So if you're record people, this is like this is a, a stop for sure. That's great. How about uh, how about your favorite find, band or otherwise? What's uh, I know it's probably mm. like asking you which one is which one is your favorite child, but uh, yeah. You mean like record or artist? Like first, like favorite record I've ever like discovered or? Yeah, how about your favorite record you've ever discovered? I, I think I can answer that more. Um, also at that same flea market. Um, I think I was like 18, maybe. And I was buying some records out of this dude's trunk, of course, as you're as you prone to do at a flea market. And uh, uh, my dad was like, oh, this is my boy, Terry. He's... He's getting into funk and soul, heavy funk and soul. And I was like, you know, I'm just kind of like, oh, okay. And uh, and he said, oh, we're here. And he handed me this Ohio Players record. And I was like, oh, man. Like, even back then, I was already being snobby. I was like, nah, man, I'm not really into the Ohio Players, man. Like, that's, that's like a little too corny for me. And he was like, this one isn't. And it was Observations in Time, the first Ohio Players record. And I was like, okay, guy with that I'm buying records out of your trunk, I'll buy it. It was like 10 bucks or 15 bucks or something. So I bought it and that was like one of those like, man, I was wrong and this stuff just changed my life moments. It's like that first record from 69 is just like this weird Midwest R&B soul record. It's just, 
it's not unlike any it's unlike anything else they did after that when they got signed to westbound and mercury but um it's just like raw kind of weird at times um amazing amazing record so that's like it's my favorite find of all time how about uh how about your favorite band your favorite child is there something uh, a new discovery somebody that's really really lighting you up these days um i'm i I could not pick a favorite band to save my life that we work with but because i do really love work they're all friends you know they're all they're all friends and but um you know this i'm really this year we have a bunch of cool stuff you know like i think what's the the karma chief stuff has been really fun because it's sort of um just different you know it's different worlds and different challenges and um but like this year we have the new delvon which is amazing that comes out at the end of the month and it's killer and then we have the brighter days ahead comp which is going to be amazing we're putting out neil francis's demos in march and then we got soul slaps three in june for record store day which we haven't announced but the karma chief stuff to me is like really really it's fun because it's just hard hard in different ways you know like the coal mine stuff i feel like we're really getting good at and now it's a matter of like getting good at it and then just taking it to the next level so like delvon how do we go from doing this many records and this many streams to this many you know kelly same thing monophonics how do you know how do we move those people up tiers and karma chief is like man these are all different are all going to take unique and different approaches um so you know kendra morris we're working with kendra morris and you know she's just amazingly talented and andrew gabbard and um rudy deanda and it's just they're they're just all different so it's kind of fun because it kind of sharpens your you know your record label toolkit i guess you know because you got to figure out how to market a guy that kind of sounds like brian wilson when you've never done that before <laughs> how about uh doo-wop your favorite doo-wop record i do a doo-wop oh, special every year i uh, i uh, love doo-wop reminds me of riding in the back of my mom's station wagon and and honestly there's just it, it's a sound that maybe it had a little bit of a revival in the late seventies with Greece and Sha Na Na and that kind of stuff, but it it really hasn't hasn't come back. So there there seems to be an authenticity about that sound. Is there a, is there one of those that uh, that really grabs you by the boo boo? Oh, hundred percent, dude. Um, I think the Shep and the Limelights and the Heartbeat stuff is just like untouchable. You know, like thousand miles away done like that's just that's that era that stuff is just how it was recorded and yeah like you said that's a really that's a hard thing to duplicate that vibe like that is because you can't hide behind you know we can hide behind reverb spring reverb here pretty well you know you get some dirty drums spring reverb man you're 85 percent of the way there you know like and, I, and by the way, I tell people that all the time and they still don't do it. But people are like, how can we make a record sound like yours? Like, I don't know. Go get a four track cassette, hit the preamps as hard as you can with some terrible mics and crank the spring reverb. And you're literally 85% of our, our records. There you are, dude. And they're like, okay, well, I went and got a nice Neumann. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> no. Why'd you do that? Um, but the doo-wop stuff is like, you know, you just got one mic in a room, probably an upright bass that you can maybe barely hear, uh, and you know, vibraphones as loud as the vocals. <laughs> I mean, those records are just—they're oh, so special. And I—I I remember the first CD I bought was a Shep and the Heartbeat, a Shep and the Limelights and Heartbeats CD. It was—I was probably the only CD we had in our house for like ten years growing up, and. I mean, th- those songs are just burnt in my head. You know, like I will, th- nobody, I can know, I know all the subtleties of those tunes. I think that's my favorite, but there's a lot too. There's a lot of cool Detroit doo-wop on, uh, man, what was that label? Oh, man. Damn it. The cool label in Detroit, they did, uh, the Columbus Pharaohs had a 45 on there. Anyway, I, I can't remember, but I love doo-wop stuff is, is pretty tough to me. So uh, certainly we're big fans of say uh, Neil Francis or Ikebe Shakedown or 
a lot of the other Ross uh, bands you have on the roster there at Coal Mine. What's coming up for you guys? What's in the pipeline? So definitely a weird last 12 months because we've had to shift a lot of things around. So a lot of trying to be patient with artists and then be patient with us and us be patient with our pressing plant and all that kind of stuff. But um, the end of this month, we got a pretty big one. Uh, the Delvon Lamar organ trio have their sophomore studio record. I told you so. It's, it's fantastic. It's great. We're really proud of all aspects of it. Um, I did all the, I took the, I did, I did all the artwork and I took the photo for it here in Cincinnati. So it feels good. feels fun. Um, and then we have our compilation brighter days ahead right after that in February, which is a bunch of digital singles that we released during the pandemic to kind of get people over the hump, you know, give artists something to talk about, give us something to talk about, give people new music. And that's one LP of Carmen chief, one LP of coal mine. Um, so that's very fun. And then we got Neil Francis's demos, which we haven't announced yet. I think we'll be announcing those Monday. That'll be out in March. We get a bunch of 45s. Like, I don't even want to start rattling them off because there's too many. There's like 20 or 25 in the queue. Um, and then uh, Soul Slabs 3 will be coming out in June for Record Store Day, which is always a kind of a big highlight of the year. And that those comps are kind of like... Uh, gateway drugs you know for for what we do it's always nice to see somebody that gets that and they're like oh yeah i picked up this comp because it looked cool and now i love you know all these artists so uh and then the fall is just going to be it's going to be backloaded pretty heavy i think there's going to be a lot of stuff that ga20 has a new record um andrew gabbard will have a record i think kendra morris will have a record um so a lot of karma chief stuff and then Rugged Nuggets, Junior Thomas. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff on the horizon. Well, before I let you go, first of all, thanks for coming in today. But I always want to yeah. find out what uh, what presently is in your cassette deck, turntable, CD player, eight track player. What uh, right now? What's moving, Terry Cole? Let's see. What did I listen to this morning? I I played a record this morning. What the hell record? Played a Dr. John record. I usually play one record when I wake up in the morning. I like wake up I'll, and while I'm making breakfast for all of us and my wife is feeding the dog and cat, I will like play one or two sides of a record. Um, I played, uh, damn it. Uh, oh, oh, the, the, the L. Michaels record that he did with uh, Raekwon. I played that this morning and I played dr john an a side of dr john and i played part of that say jorge record from life aquatic that's that's what i played this week i think this week yeah say jorge is a beautiful album oh my gosh i love that yeah. it's just like it's so weird to hear like these songs that you know so well in, in portuguese, portuguese. <laughs> and you're just like it's so it's a it's a weird feeling of, i guess it's just at the core of all those wes anderson movies it's like it's a weird feeling of tongue-in-cheekness but also like really genuine and sweet you know and you're like and tender you know you're like man he's like exposing things about these bowie songs that i never even would have thought i could feel about these david bowie songs but yeah it's cool so i mean whoever's idea that was you know kudos he can put his finger on a feeling yeah man yeah it's it's it's, it's so strange to that's a talent when you can take a song that everybody knows and and make somebody feel something totally different with that song like that's that's a true sign of a good singer or a performer wonderful thank you so much for coming on today yeah thanks for having me. we really appreciate all the love and support appreciate your time terry <laughs>